thank you for joining us for Creative Women, Creative Business, Feminist Publishing, Design and Comics. We're delighted to have you today on the last event of this fantastic three-day festival organized by the Business of Women's Words Research Project in collaboration with the British Library. This is, as I said, the last event and it for the project, which doesn't quite end yet, but is nearly drawing to a close, it marks the end of the most amazing three-year project, working with partners at Sussex University, Cambridge University, and the British Library. And I just wanted to do a really public and warm thanks to everyone on that research team, and especially Professor Margareta Jolly, the project lead. It's been a, a, an amazing piece of work, and for me, best practice in working across institutions to deliver amazing scholarship but also wonderful services and engagement and this hopefully you'll get a taste of today. It's Polly Russell and I am the lead partner for the project at the British Library but I'm also the lead curator for the uh, Unfinished Business the Fight for Women's Rights exhibition which is currently staged at the exhibition although tragically because of Covid it is of course not open. It is, however, running until August, so hopefully when all of this is over, we'll be able to open the doors again and many of you will be able to visit and come and see the exhibition in person. We would love to welcome you. It's absolutely fitting that this three-day festival is being run alongside the exhibition because the exhibition so much celebrates women's tenacity, ingenuity, and of course, creativity in insisting on space, on demanding rights, on being heard and of course on finding out or working out ways to make a living. So I'm absolutely thrilled this festival has been running. Today's event uh, is called How to Make, sorry it is not, today's event is called Creative Women in a Capitalist World and it features some expert game changers and challengers, Roisin Boyd, Sophia Niazza, and Catherine Riley, and will be chaired by Dr. Lucy Delap, who's one of the project partners for the Business of Women's Words. I'll hand over to Lucy in just one second, but I want to mention a few housekeeping things. On your uh, screen, there is a tab for the bookshop. This will feature all of publications, as many publications as we could include for um, all of the speakers across the festival. Please do have a look at it. It would normally feature the um, as a child, it would normally feature a uh, the, go straight to the British Library um, online website because of COVID that's closed. So we've linked to independent retailers. Um, this event and in fact, all of the events of this festival will be available for you to view for the next seven days with your link. So please do check out any that you missed over the three days. Um, Beyond this festival, we also, the British Library, are running events which speak to lots of the themes of this festival. So we have coming up next month talks with Alison Bechdel, the cartoonist, uh, the artist and writer Laurie Anderson, and on the 26th of this month, a talk between Gillian Tett and the economist Mariana Mazacuto. Finally, before I hand over to Lucy, one more thing, which is that we can't wait to hear from these panelists, but we also can't wait to hear from you. So please do submit questions. There is a box at the bottom of your screens where you can write questions. And I know the panelists and Lucy will be keen to hear from you. Okay, enjoy the next hour. Thanks so much, Polly. Uh, welcome everybody to this session on creative feminisms in a capitalist world. So we're here today to talk about feminist creativity and those of you who've been at the uh, festival already for the last couple of days will have seen a lot of examples of that and perhaps experiment a little bit yourselves with creative acts like making comics. Um, we're going to focus on two particular themes. One of them is going to be the, the entanglement and the possibilities of inspiration and a rich relationship between past and present. So we're going to be looking back to think about Creati creativity in the past and asking ourselves where do these impulses go uh, in today's in today's world. The other big theme for us today is asking how is it possible to create uh, creative politics and um, projects within a capitalist world. And some of you may be really familiar with the, the long standing um, feminist critique of the kind of the twin systems as they're often termed of uh, capitalism and patriarchy and the idea that women are predominantly excluded as our non-binary people within uh, uh, capitalist and patriarchal systems. That's a very long-standing 
um, uh, form of feminist critique. But today I want to try and usher onto the, onto the scene a slightly different story. Can I have the, the first slide, please? And ask what kinds of um, feminist projects we can see if we ask about the founding of business and the question of, of feminist enterprise. That might allow us to think about creation of feminist uh, goods. You can see here on the top of the slide, um, the, the feminist lipstick, which is sold through Lipstick Lobby, uh, an American business, a bit of a slick American business founded in 2017 that describes itself not as a business, but in their words as, quote, a social justice movement for change. It asks its customers to pucker up in protest. There's, of course, a long tradition of this within um, uh, women's movements and feminist movements, and I couldn't resist giving you at the bottom there of the slide, uh, Sylvia Pankhurst's beautiful design for a suffragette uh, tea set from the early 20th century. It's not only um, uh, goods, but also services that we can see um, offered and traded and in initiated within women's movements. And here's um, uh, a, an example of that from a, 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 what describes itself very firmly as a feminist business providing housekeeping services in the American Midwest uh, in the 1970s. And we might set this alongside other kinds of feminist services such as um, therapy and counseling projects or feminist bands. There's, there's been a, a no end to the kinds of um, uh, innovative uh, services that have been offered. We can also think about how um, enterprise has created really important feminist spaces. We might think of the global success of feminist bookshops and, and, and the slide shows one of the well-established ones in San Francisco. And these um, uh, services, goods and spaces all help in making money and creating jobs for women and non-binary people. And of course, that's no mean feat in a world where uh, they have often been paid less and excluded from all kinds of economic and financial advantages. Feminist publishers, journals and printing presses have been at the core of promoting feminist ideas and feminist dreams and feminist campaigns. But those who've founded these kinds of projects have faced often quite vivid uh, and difficult uh, choices and conundrums within a capitalist marketplace. So let's uh, dive in today to talk to our panelists about their experiences of those kinds of choices and conundrums for their feminist politics and feminist enterprises. Our panel today uh, is composed of activists and innovators who've lived through and um, experienced and thought deeply about the trade-offs and advantages of different kinds of feminist projects and platforms. And I'm really delighted to welcome them. So first of all, let's welcome Roisin Boyd, who's an award-winning journalist who began her journalistic career when she left Dublin in 1980 and went to work for Spare Rib magazine. She was there for um, uh, three years and on leaving Spare Rib, she returned to Dublin to work for RTE's radio program, uh, Women Today. She stayed with RTE for 16 years as a presenter, a reporter, uh, and a current affairs producer working on uh, stories to do with um, international issues, social justice, and human rights. And she's now a lecturer in journalism at the Technological University of Dublin. We're then going to hear from Dr. Catherine Riley, who is a feminist historian and a writer who has taught at the universities of Lancaster and Northumbria, as well as Birkbeck College in London. Uh, she, she wrote her, her doctoral uh, dissertation there on the feminist publisher Virago, um, and that led to um, her first book, and you, you, you can see uh, links to her books under the book tab above. Um, uh, and she's in fact published very widely on women's writing and publishing. Interestingly, she's also taken a turn into politics. She was the uh, head of communications at the Women's Equality Party from its founding days, building it up to um, uh, the conclusion of the 2017 general election. Uh, and she left uh, the Women's Equality Party there to work at uh, um, Prima Donna Festival, which is um, uh, a festival focused on writing, creativity and ideas with a particular focus on gender and diversity and equality. And she's general manager there and continues to work and publish uh, uh, very widely on questions of gender theory and praxis. And finally, uh, welcome to Sophia Niazi, who's an artist and an illustrator and a member of one of my kind collective um, where she, um, she works with them on um, uh, a community print workshop, uh, Rabbits Road Press uh, in Newham, as well as pursuing her own um, artistic uh, work, researching and producing um, uh, pieces relating to housing and technology. 
She leads workshops and delivers talks uh, across the community, but also lectures um, for Birmingham City. So welcome to Sophia, Roisin and Catherine. And I'm going to ask Roisin to talk to us first about her experiences of feminist creativity in a capitalist world. Thanks, Roisin. Thank you very much, Lucy, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me and hi everyone on the panel and hi everyone that's listening to us out there. I'm in Dublin um, and this um, invitation has given me an opportunity really to, to look back at my experience working in Spare Rib. I worked there from 1980 to 1983. I left Dublin to work in Spare Rib. Um, so it was an extraordinary time. It was an extraordinary time politically. Um, though, of course, we are all living in extraordinary times now. Sorry, I'm overusing that word. And I have been thinking um, about the fact that I lived in London and the poignancy of that for me now and for, I imagine, a lot of you, um, the fact that we have Brexit now. And um, that's made a huge impact here in Ireland. And in some ways, it's been very interesting for me as an Irish woman, because I went to work in Spare Rib, as I said, in 1980. I was the first Irish woman on the collective. The collective wasn't really particularly diverse at that stage. There were mainly uh, white women who were upper class, middle class, um, North American and English women. It changed over time. But the, the fact of um, Brexit for us here in Ireland was we were very surprised during the debates over the last number of years at the lack of awareness of Ireland and Irish people in the UK. We thought, it, well, I certainly thought it would have changed from um, the 1980s. So I came to Spare Rib in 1980 um, and it was an extraordinary experience and I feel really privileged to have worked there. Um, I feel very grateful to all the women who set it up um, and to the women that I got to know on that collective. Um, so, Talking about capitalism, again, I, I hadn't really thought about the fact, I was young, I was 23, 24, completely consumed by feminism, by the women's movement, by politics, so didn't really think a lot of the time about money, and I think as the years have gone on, I haven't either, and probably to my disadvantage, but anyway, politics and change and um, feminism and wanting to bring about change in society, but also for women was my priority. So Spare Rib worked um, as a collective. Um, so we were all um, theoretically equal, there was no hierarchy. But again, thinking about this, um, when I was preparing for this talk, I think there were obviously different levels, but we, we worked as a collective. And I, I came across, um, I was looking, I have the, the magazines here, I have them um, bound, a very, uh, a very close friend of mine got them bound for me when I left the, the three years. And I was looking at um, one of the issues where they discussed as an editorial, or we discussed the fact of how we worked as a collective. And in the editorial it says, this is 1980, I think, or 1981, we never really thought about how we worked as a collective, how we made editorial decisions. And there was a big controversy at the time around um, um, sexuality, heterosexism and uh, lesbianism. And, and this had become really, really controversial in the collective. And this editorial addresses those issues. And I am struck when I read it, or I was struck, at the honesty. We were really open. Um, there were loads of issues, loads of criticisms, loads of tensions on the collective, but we put it all out there. And I, and I think that really is to the credit of the women working in the collective. So getting back to um, capitalism. So I arrived in 1980 and Margaret Thatcher had just been elected the year before. Um, so she was obviously a hyper capitalist. I was thinking about this, the, you know, going into the belly of the beast really. Um, and for us as feminists and working in the Spare Rib Collective, we're often asked, oh, aren't you all delighted now you have a female or there is a female prime minister elected in the UK? And of course we weren't delighted. It made things probably more difficult in some ways. But again, thinking about capitalism. So this was a time of huge change in, um, in, in Britain. And I think we're seeing the, the consequences of what started with Thatcherism in, in, in 1980. Um, but a lot of the destruction of 
what she said, you know, she said there was no society. A lot of what has happened in the intervening years, like if we look at what's happened with housing, people living in poverty, we were able, the reason we were able to work for such low wages on spare rib um, was because there was very cheap housing. So I lived in a squat. A lot of the people on the collective um, lived in um, cooperative housing. Now there were differences on the collective. And again, I think um, in some of the literature, Lucy and Margareta have written about spare rib and um, how, how feminist enterprises were able to survive is the fact that there were low wages um, and that a lot of the labor was free and <laughs> we provided free labor. But the reason I was able to work, you know, I think I got 80 pounds a week, or maybe it was a month, I think it was a week, uh, was because I, I lived in a squat. Um, some of the women were older, so they probably were more established. They had their own houses and some had private incomes. So it, it, I think it's just interesting to talk about that, how one actually does work in those sort of circumstances when you're working um, to produce a magazine, um, but you're getting very low pay. The other, um, the other aspect of spare rib. So we were always, money was always a big issue, um, how we would survive. And we didn't really take, we didn't, not really, we didn't take commercial ads. We, <laughs> we just had certain long running ads. So one of the ads was for vibrators. And apparently there was a rumor that this might have been the reason that spare rib was banned in Ireland. So at one stage spare rib was banned in Ireland. It was never defined about the reason was never given about why it was um, why it was banned. But this apparently was one of the reasons um, the ads for vibrators. And I was looking at it today. It's a very discreet ad. It says what every woman. I don't know if you can see it there. Uh, yeah, what every woman should know about vibrators. Um, the other ads were for abortion advice, um, dungarees. Um, very, very interesting to look at the to look at those ads. Then the other thing that happened um, regarding the finances of spare rib and how we might survive. So there was constant discussions about how we might survive and the, the difficulties we were experiencing was um, that we were taken on by Comag, which were they were huge distributors, and my job was. <laughs> which I hadn't quite realized, I think, before I took the job, was to um, work with Comag, to work with a really lovely woman called Jill Simmons, who was the Comag representative. And to go, I had to go around with her to try and persuade shops, because um, we really wanted to be widely distributed. And until then, I think we it was mainly subscriptions. We were sold at conferences, um, places like that. So distribution was a huge issue. And a lot of the shops or the news agents would, wouldn't take us on or they didn't know where to put us. We wanted to be beside Cosmopolitan because Comag distributed Cosmopolitan. We said that's where we should be on the shelves. But they often, I think they even wanted to put us up on the top shelf with the porn mags or food because spare rib, or, you know, they didn't know where to put us. So this was a big issue for us to, you know, to be, to be there with those women's magazines. Um, so I used to go around with Jill talking to the shops and we did get WH Smith, I think took us on, which was a, which was a huge, um, huge achievement. But, but we always had, there were always very mixed feelings about capitalism, obviously, but we wanted to survive and we wanted to get the message out there. And we were, I was even thinking about this again today, not evangelical, maybe a little bit and probably nothing wrong with that, but we really, really wanted to get the message out to women. Um, and, when you think about it, and for all of you younger people who are what younger people who are watching today, and this I, might sound really strange, but it was 40 years ago, so we didn't have any internet, um, we didn't have mobile phones. Um, so letters, the actual physical letters that came to Spare Rib were really important, and often people said that that was their favorite page. And in the letters pages, women, and maybe when women would ring us as well, they'd often say, you're my only you're my only connection to other women, to other feminists. And that was hugely important when you think about it. And it used to make it really worthwhile. I used to get such a buzz if somebody rang or they wrote a letter and said, your article really touched me or it connected with me because I am quite isolated. A lot of women were isolated in different countries around the world and in, in England. Um, and then finally, I'm probably nearly at my five minutes on my Lucy. <laughs> um, so 
finally, I want to finish with um, one of the things that I really, really was, was such a gift and I really appreciate about Spare Rib was the international connection that we connected with women all around the world. And there were women working on the collective who were, when I was there, who were from Iran, Farzane and Mani, and they had had to leave Iran after the Iranian revolution. So tragic, they'd fought against the Shah and then they had to leave and they came to the UK. So they worked in the, the collective and then the collective changed over the years and became much more diverse with women of color and black women working in the collective. But one, one aspect of this internationalism and that I really appreciated was connecting, as I said, with, with women from all around the world. But I do remember one day um, and Spare Rib was completely open. Anybody could walk in. We, we worked in a, um, a converted warehouse in Clerkenwell Close. And again, you would, there's no way you'd be able to, to afford the rents there now. And this woman came in and her name was Radha Gungaloo and she's from Mauritius. And she said, I want, we got talking, I did the news short, she said, I want you to cover what is happening in Diego Garcia. And I don't know if any of you have heard of Diego Garcia. And the interesting thing is, or the sad thing is, it's still a story today. And a lot of the issues that we covered are still relevant today. The people who lived in Diego Garcia had been uh, forcibly removed from the island by the United States and by the British because they wanted to um, set up a military base there. And Radha came in and said, I want you to cover this story. And we did cover the story. And Radha was studying law at that time in, in, in London. And she went back to Mauritius where she became a judge. And I always remember her telling me, um, she was probably one of the few people I'd actually met in this context, that she'd grown up in uh, very, very difficult circumstances and she used to go hungry to bed at night. And so we interviewed Arada, her, we talked about Diego Garcia on Spare Rib. And yeah, so that's just one, one small um, story from all the different stories that we covered on Spare Rib. So I, I'll stop now. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Roisin, that was super. Let's move on now to, to Dr. Catherine Riley. Catherine. Hi, um, I'm gonna move smoothly from Spare Rib to talking about my um, kind of introduction into the world of uh, publishing and culture more generally. So um, I started my thesis um, looking at Virago, uh, which was going to be called Spare Rib Books, apparently. Um, so it was uh, Marsha Rowe and uh, Rosie Boycott who set Spare Rib up. We're talking with Carmen Khalil, this um, irascible powerhouse of a woman who wanted to set up a publishing house, believing that publish, holding the power to publish is a wonderful thing, um, a sentiment with which I entirely agree. So. Um, I started looking into Virago and this, uh, this tension between publishing and profit, um, politics and profit, has kind of been at the heart of my thinking and what I do ever since then. So um, Virago, Virago's entrepreneurs kind of identified that there was always going to be this conflict, but Carmen Khalil set out very deliberately to make her enterprise a profit-making enterprise. Um, and she said that it would become necessarily a feminist enterprise by virtue of making money. I mean, she also, when I was, I'm kind of, I'm, con I'm convinced by that argument. And I also, uh, she, you know, countered the idea that business ca capitalism is a male realm. And I, I think I'm convinced by that argument as well. And um, so I, my thesis turned into a book, which is called The Virago Story. Um, and we heard earlier in the festival from uh, Lenny, who has been in with Virago almost since the beginning. Um, and it's a fantastic a successory, I, I think, for feminism and for publishing more generally. Um, and I was, yeah, it was, it, it kind of became my life for a significant period of it. Um, but taught me a lot about the publishing world and uh, not only um, in terms of feminism, but more broadly, um, and also gave me a huge insight into different feminist ideologies and different approaches. So based on that um, expertise, I, I also wrote a book um, called Feminism and Women's Writing and Introduction both of them are artfully poised behind my head, obviously, being Zoom, um, uh, which looked at the ways that feminist activism um, interacts and affects the uh, women's fiction. So the form of women's fiction and the content. Um, uh, yeah, so, and, I, and then I was uh, kind of involved in academia and teaching, so moved a little bit away from the cultural world and then fell completely by accident into the world of politics, as you mentioned in our, in our introduction, working for the Women's Equality Party. 
Um, but the point, I, the reason I bring that up is that actually the intervention, the radical interventions we made um, with that party and that the party continues to make without me, um, are they're not only political; they're deeply cultural. So some of the some of the things that we did, uh, we set out to do politics differently. That was a that was a premise of the party. So we did actually quite madcap crazy things now when I look back. So one of our first stunts was to uh, create a big check, literally a very big check, and walk with it down to the treasury. And it had written across it the, the, the sum, billions of pounds, that would be added to the British economy if women were free, economically free to input in the ways that they could and wanted to. So if childcare was free, you know, if, if work looked different. Um, we also had campaigns like No Size Fits All, which looked at uh, women's body, the fashion industry and bo uh, body image, sizing of clothing, um, which doesn't sound very political, but actually it's massively political. The health budget has to accommodate millions and millions of pounds each year to combat the negative impact of girls and women's self negative self image because of the way that the fashion industry impacts. Um, so it was it was. Um, a fascinating and exhausting two and a half years, um, at the end of which, um, as, you, as you mentioned, Lucy, at the end of the 2017 election, um, I left. Um, and probably, I also, my two books were published in the immediate aftermath of that, which means I must have been writing the edits during that time. I have no idea when I slept. It was <laughs> a busy period. Um, then through knowing Catherine Mayer, who set up the Women's Equality Party with Sandy Toxvig, um, I was invited to join the uh, the kind of group of women who set up Prima Donna Festival. Um, Prima Donna is uh, it's a UK literary festival, um, and it aims to like to do a number of things. So it aims to level up the publishing industry, creating opportunities for writers that aren't heard necessarily on the on the festival circuit. It aims to create to, to sort of to find new writing talent, and ultimately we aim to create life changing, beautiful, fun events. Um, so our first festival was held in 2019 and it's very difficult to picture this now but it, we were outside and people were hugging and the sun was shining and um, <laughs> nobody had ever heard of coronavirus um, and it was a, it was a, a really wonderful event bringing together editors, readers, publishers, cooks, poets, um, musicians and um, to share experiences and explore ideas. Um, we were honoured to welcome in 2019 two bookish shortlisters who then including Bernadine uh, Elif Shafak and Bernadine Evaristo prior to her win. She then went, became the Booker winner that year. Um, and Guy Gun Gunaratni, Diana Evans, Amanda Prowse, Katie Brand, hugely um, famous and brilliant people, but also we have a programming principle, which is that we 50% uh, of our programming goes to established writers, 50% goes to emerging writers. So there's always new talent, there's always new ideas floating around. Um, we one of the things we're most proud of is that we, because of the nature of the festival, it's, very, it's quite small, it's quite intimate, you, you can literally walk around the festival site and speak to an agent or speak to a publisher or speak to Bernadine Evaristo. You know, it's, it's, it's that kind of, it's such a small scale and so intimate that everybody kind of chips into the idea and chips into that um, ethos. So we, from the first festival, two people pitched their ideas to um, agents that were there and now have been published by major mainstream houses um, we went virtual last year um, and one of our virtual events resulted in the the participants being signed to radio 4 extras news, news jack sorry when she'd been mentored by one of our prima donnas um, and we also we we launched the prima donna prize in 2019 for unsigned and unagented writers so um it's 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 the the prize is judged completely blind um and without regard to spelling or grammar it's just looking at the raw talent um and we're delighted that the winner of the inaugural prize uh, again signed a major publishing deal and her book is coming out next year plus region one we'll called lisa um this year's prize is to be judged by elif shafak and june sarpong and the uh, the award event uh, I think is taking place if not at the British Library then with the British Library sometime in March. Um, everything we do is the products of the imaginations and efforts of our founding group uh, 17 women drawn from entertainment publishing we call ourselves the prima donnas because why not um, and 
we got together to, with the, at the start of 2019 with the aim of establishing a weekend of writing ideas that would give prominence to work by women, but also spotlight authors from the margins. Um, and yeah, that's what we've been doing ever since. And we're very hopeful that our festival this summer, the end of July, can go ahead in a physical format. And we, yeah, we'd love to welcome you all there um, to Suffolk. Thanks. Thanks so much, Catherine. You, you've been very well behaved for a prima donna, I must say. I'm, I'm expecting <laughs> some flouncing or some walking out in a minute. <laughs> yeah, you can see me off camera. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Sophia. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about UNC and then come back to the business aspect to um, give it a bit of context. So UNC is a publication about women, art and activism. Uh, and we've been running it since 2013, 2014. Um, and it's run by myself, Rose Nordin and Hiba Lamara. Um, so it's a biannual and each issue has a different creative theme and I'd kind of like to echo what Roisin was saying about publishing being this vehicle to really um, connect with people and even though I've grown up in a, in a different time where we have the internet, being a young Muslim woman when we started this we found that um, mainstream media channels were, were kind of saying the same thing and were dictating what Muslims and Muslim women could talk about. So even though we had so much access, we also couldn't really see each other or hear each other. So one of the, the reasons we started the publication was to kind of uh, talk and make on our own terms. So it's a very visual led publication. We wanted to uh, invite artists and creatives to respond to a new theme um, for each issue. We were kind of working uh, with the backdrop of Tumblr. So Tumblr was really big at this time and we were noticing that loads of people instead of making their own work, they were kind of just reblogging um, and sharing existing work. And with a magazine, we were really keen to put out this invitation of creating new work. Uh, initially, we thought it would be a magazine which, was, which had contributions just from Muslim women. But uh, as we started working through it, we realized that wasn't an honest representation of our actual worlds and our creative world. So we tried to limit it to like 50% Muslim women and 50% anyone else. In terms of how UMC views feminism or how we fit into feminism, uh, it's a term that we're really happy to be associated with. It's a term that we're able to connect with other women, other groups, other feminists with. But myself, Rose and Hiba, we're all Muslim. So in terms of ethics and um, our outlook, we, we already have like a, a system in place or like a code in place. Uh, coming up with this manifesto was a really helpful way of uh, shaping what we wanted from the collective and what we wanted uh, to be presenting to a broader public. I think in terms of feminism, the third point uh, is uh, relative, is um, the most relevant. So it takes the aspirations and concerns of women and girls seriously and recognizes and nurtures their creative work and intellectual contributions um, in fields where they are often undermined or downplayed. So that's how I would bring feminism into IMC as a project. We also take great inspiration from uh, organizations or projects like Sea Red Women's Workshop, especially when we come to thinking about businesses and business models and how your uh, beliefs and mission kind of relates to money uh, and the way you work with other people in your project or company. So as you can imagine, we didn't make any money from UMC. We also didn't have any advertising like you, Rasheen, and our efforts to distribute were very uh, ad hoc and going up to shops, and just checking if they would take our publication. The project um, and our aims were not coming out of nowhere. We were all illustrators and publishing before we started UMC, our own comics. So we were, we were aware of the ecosystem and the, the areas where we could sell things. Um, so we started a design studio to try and make some money and continue our work. And we started making our own books and selling them. This is a book that we made with Bookworks about libraries. So we recognized very quickly that UMC was taking up all of our energy and we weren't, our, our own creativity was kind of being sidelined. So we kept trying to push inroads to making our own work. Uh, this is a publication that came about uh, as part of a research trip and also talking about like going back to Roisin and thinking about an international audience and 
broadening who we were talking to and how we were learning. Uh, we did a research trip to Malaysia and we learned a lot about publishing there. And a lot of this information wasn't available to us. Self-publishing was very much about New York or Berlin or London or, or these places. So we were interested in what was happening in Asia and uh, Rose has a connection with Malaysia. So that was a place that we, we wanted to go. Uh, off the back of this, we had been working with different art galleries and institutions and we were approached by Create London to start a project in an old library in Manor Park. And myself, Rose and Hibber, we, we myself and Rose in particular, in particular were interested in risograph printing. Uh, we had backgrounds in illustration, but were not able to get access to these machines. And because we're very DIY, we thought let's just try and include this in the project and figure out how to use it afterwards. And this was very much about the self-publishing ecosystem and creating ecosystems that kind of operated under capitalism, but also outside of it, so that we had the means of production, the means of distribution, the means of creating content ourselves. Uh, and what we do at the press is we have open access every other week. Anyone from the public can come in and we teach them how to use the Risograph printing press. And it has it's connected to radical publishing in that lots of political parties and used to use this machine because it was a cheap way of getting color into your ephemera. So it was really nice to be part of this tradition as well. And the, the overall effect meant what you created could be looked at as like a limited edition print. So you could also make money. So people who were coming to use the press could also sell the work. So it wasn't just about us producing our work. It was about kind of stepping away from being gatekeepers. And this is just a picture of the press in action. Uh, another example of how we work with local people. And this was a parents group from a local school that we made seed packets with. And then a group who were doing an action relating to pollution in the local area. So we're trying to find like lots of applications for printing that are relevant to local people instead of assuming that they would know what it was for. This is when we went to the Museum of London to take one of our machines to do printing there. So really thinking about how to broaden our audiences and also make money because these larger institutions have a lot of money. So that's a way that we're able to continue um, the other work that we do. And just coming back to this ecosystem, we also run a publishing fair called DIY Cultures. And we ran that for five years and around 2000 people came to each edition. And it was, an, it was a space where we could kind of explore the intersections between arts and activism. But it also, people made a lot of money at this fair. You know, they would sell, um, they would sell loads because there was such a large footfall and there was such an appetite for IRL events. Um, and it was kind of trying to bridge a gap in the self-publishing world or to create a new area where people were kind of thinking about the context like different contexts which use publishing and how they relate to causes as opposed to just individual artists. I don't think I have time to go through these, but this is the business side of things. So we think very much in terms of what we give and what we take. I wasn't sure if I was right for this presentation because a lot of our income is actually from grants. But um, yeah, so we take a lot of things. We take money, time, ideas, um, art and you can see all of the different people who are kind of involved in that ecosystem um, and and this uh, and we also think about what we give so it means we're able to really easily figure out if what we're doing is on track or not so the first thing is we give we give to ourselves we give ourselves like a space to work in we give ourselves an audience um, means of production access to equipment training and then we extend these to other people and we recognize that even by taking money from organizations or the arts council we are also helping them because we are helping them to fulfill what their aims are or, you know um so i guess that's taken a while to to visualize what we're doing but that is what we are doing and we're making enough money to continue our core program but our business is very much something <clears throat> that's come about after deciding what our focus is and what our core aims are as a group of people. Um, and that's what we, why we always refer back to our manifesto. We're like, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to achieve? It was never maximum profit because going into this, we knew publishing is not how you make money. And it was more about how do you create, um, I think Rashin again, it's about freedom. Like how do you create 
uh, environment, system, structures where you feel free, you feel connected with other people. Um, and just on that note, I think working as a group and working together has allowed us to feel free in pursuing our own practices. So instead of it being something that takes away from it, it's actually uh, enriched it a lot and nourished it. And this has come about because we've decided that being full-time employees of our business is not our goal. Our goal is just to complete what we our main aims are and then to think about success as the kind of how do we lead the kind of lives that we want to live and how do we kind of have the relationships that we want as opposed to how do we increase how much money we're making every year and whether our project is growing every year yep and that's the presentation thank you thank you so much Sophia. that was really fascinating you've given us actually a really uh you know interesting and clear sense of this broad ecosystem that has within it grant giving organizations local authorities uh, the, the you know the kind of the core business of, of of selling products but also the kind of the question of values and and the life you want to live and in particular great to hear about your sense of of the autonomy of production and and, and the diy focus which i think resonates so much with uh what roshin and, and, and catherine also had to say so that gives us real inspiration of, of inspiration of, of past projects and present projects. And I can see a bunch of questions rolling in already. Uh, so I'm going to plunge straight in so that we have enough time to cover them all. And I'm going to ask, first of all, a question um, actually for Sophia about longevity. Now, Catherine and Roisin told us about some quite um, lengthy surviving projects. Virago is, is, is still there. Spare Rib was one of the longest um, and most successful of the Women's Liberation publications. Uh, Sophia Umk, and I didn't, I didn't have the courage to pronounce it as Umk before, but I like it. Umk has um, uh, been in, been in place for seven years. It's, so it's kind of it's a mid range project. It's clearly not just a, a, a kind of a flash in the pan. What's your feeling about the kind of the pros and cons of going for a kind of a long standing, well established project as opposed to the kind of the fun and the inspiration of of just doing things in a um, in a more ephemeral sense. Um. I think because we've done so many different things, it feels like unk has gone through many phases and it's also attached to a much larger collective. So there are lots of different artists and um, yeah, but I would say Unk, it didn't start off as a business. It started off as a collective and as a group of people. And I don't, like if that ends, it's a really a failure of our relationships because part of working is figuring out ways of staying in contact in, in being in communication and supporting each other. Um, yeah, which is why it's a bit strange to talk about it as a business because the, because it's so embedded in our lives and in our, in our various practices. Um, so we definitely think long-term, but we're also very adaptable and flexible because we have those cool, um, Kind of values and beliefs and and this so the way they manifest can be so different like yeah we can be a magazine and then we can be a printing press and then we can just be like an event and then we can have downtime and it means everybody because it doesn't take up all of our time each of us has broader practice and other things so uh i don't know if that answered your question it does and i, I think um it introduces the the idea of emotional labor and self-care which, you know, ideas which really should be in there in, in any talk about business and enterprise, and but which, you know, isn't seen if we just take business to be the balance sheet, right, the, the, the profits and the losses. Uh, and actually, that leads on really nicely to another question, a question from Francis, who asks about the personal or professional costs to pursuing your social and political uh, vision. I'm going to ask Catherine if she if she might um, look, look at this one. Sophia's talked to us about um, the problems of kind of sidelining yourself or even getting burnt out and the need to perform care. Catherine, what's what's been your experience around the costs? Um, I think I think that there are, you know, when we know there's lots written about the fact that women bear the brunt of emotional labor in the home, uh, you know, that they do so much unpaid labor in the in the economy. And um, all of the prima donnas that support the festival do so entirely on their own time. Um, and the impact of that obviously means they have less time for the things that they might want to be doing, but, but they get, we all as 
as a group get so much out of it because it's what we love it's what drives us and that passion is what drives all of the, all of the things that we're describing all of these uh, non-businesses or businesses or whatever however you would you would describe them and that's that free labor um so so for example with prima donna we have received arts council funding this year and we've also received local council funding and the reason we've been given that funding is because there's a belief in suffolk and mid suffolk where the festival is based that we will um, we'll do all the lovely cultural stuff and we'll provide a world-class literary event but the impact of that will be economic it will it will ge not gentrify it will it will have an impact on uh, local economy you know it will be an influx of hard cash um, and it will have hard impacts positive impacts on the local people um, in terms of you know well-being um, and in, in, in addition to the kind of economic stuff we we are about to launch a, a, a an embedded outreach program in Suffolk and Stowmarket and Mid Suffolk, where the festival is. Suffolk, you, you know, from as as a Londoner, <laughs> I, my my view of Suffolk is it's very bucolic, and there's lots of people with second homes there. It's, and of course, it's not there. Are, there are places like that in Suffolk, but there's lots of places that are not like that. There are lots of places where there are hard to reach groups that are far away from culture and the arts, and um, we are determined that those are the people those are the people we want to reach through the festival as well as as well as bringing in you know the big name talent that you know great thank, you. To see. thank you so much and now i want to turn to a question from from lorna and this is for you roisin uh, lorna says congratulations uh, on such a brilliant contribution uh, and asks what might you uh, tell us about the state of journalism today and what a spare rib would look like if it was if it was founded today what a great question, a really hard one to answer. And it is something that I, I've been thinking about over the last few days. Um, like imagine if Spare Rib was online, um, if it could be accessed that way. And um, yeah, I think it would be, it would make a huge difference, but it would be very different. I mean, the, the physicality of Spare Rib and, and um, you know, the actual magazine like I loved that. that, that was really important and the way it was designed and everything. Um, and I love the way Sophia talks about that, about, you know, the graphics, all that was really important. The state of journalism. Mm, so I lecture in journalism and this is something that I, am, I grapple with a lot because I'm, I'm teaching students about journalism and my colleagues as well, we often think, gosh, what are we, what are we teaching them for? Like, is it so hard to get paid jobs in journalism? But I still really, really think journalism, it's good journalism is so important. And we've seen it in the last few weeks, obviously with what's happening in the United States. Um, and the only journalist was from ITN who went into the Capitol building. I don't know if anybody's seen that footage. And that was so, so important. And he named it for what was going on. So I think journalism is obviously really, really important. It's going through a really difficult time. It, of course, will survive. It needs lots of support. It needs to diversify. It's something that I'm very, very um, involved with here in Ireland because, the, you know, media, mainstream media tends to be very white and middle class um, and male, but more there's female, but it's not diverse. It doesn't reflect what's happening in Ireland, the changes in Ireland. Um, so, yeah, so it's really important that we value our journalists and our journalism, that we pay for our journalism. Um, I think that, yeah, so hopefully that answers it. Thanks very much, Rasheen. Um, uh, I, I want to move on to a, another part of the kind of the literary and, and creative world, which is prizes. Now, um, uh, Sophia and Catherine may have both thought about the kind of the role that prizes might play in, in literary or, or the artistic world. Um, do you think prizes just set up kind of a, a new tier of gatekeepers? Uh, are, they, are they a good thing? Do they end up focusing on just the winners and, and, and excluding all, all, all the losers? What's your view? I'm going to ask Sophia first. What, what role do prizes play? Um, I mean, would you consider an arts council application a prize? Like because it feels like one because so many people apply um, <clears throat> in which case they're very important um, i feel like yeah they're good we have we've had lots of commissions at the press and they've all been small like 200 pound prizes to make a small publication or a poster and it's done a lot for people's confidence 
And I know that whenever I've got a residency or anything like that, it, it does allow you to make time and space for your own work in a way that you might not be able to, but it does reinforce gatekeeping, absolutely. Um, so I don't think that's, it's never gonna serve a majority of people. Catherine, you, you're, you're part of a, an organization that awards prizes. What's your view on prizes? Um, on a completely pragmatic um, level, I think they are a kind of necessary part of the publishing world right now. We, I think there's, I think the figure is that there are 200,000 new novels are published each year. It's a ridiculous number of books. And the, what prizes do is provide the reader with a kind of kite mark so that they can find, you know, good, good literature. Um, and I, th I think I think that can be helpful. I think that because we have a diversity of prizes now, like the Gillat Prize and the, the Women's Prize, that will that do an R Prize, the Prima Donna Prize, that will uh, spotlight writers that traditionally were left out of things like the Booker. Um, I think that they can be a useful, uh, yeah, way of, of filtering work, and and we know that they have a massive impact on sales, precisely because of all the things I've just said. They are also a problem <laughs> because those books that are picked out as you know short list and long list are given a, a disproportionate amount of publicity and that, uh, to the detriment of the you know some some work that, that didn't didn't make it that year. So I, I can see that that's a really unhelpful answer. I, I know that, but there's positives and benefits, uh, negatives and positives both both things. Thank you. Um, we've got a question uh, from Maria in the uh, in the ch question feed who's, who's asking, you know, how would it be possible for her and particularly her as somebody who lives with a lifelong health con condition to make a contribution? Sophia, she's particularly keen on on on, on the forum that, that you that you work in. But really, this is a question for for everybody. How do people who want to get a toehold want to get started in any of these worlds? How do they do that? Sophia? Um, yeah, this is something we've been thinking about a lot, especially because the way our workshop works is that you have to come to the workshop to have an induction and that immediately um, makes it difficult, if not impossible for a lot of people. So over the past um, two months, we've developed an online induction pack or a remote induction pack. Um, and as soon as lockdown's over, we'll make it available in our shop. So people uh, order a pack, it comes to you with all the instructions and everything you need to make your artwork for an induction. And then you just post it back to us, we print it and send it back to you. Um, but I, I guess we're also living in a time where accessing communities and making communities online is very possible. Uh, and a lot of the contributions that we had for IMP were just through online submissions. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, Roisin, I know you teach journalism. You've probably you know, got oodles of, of bright young things out there who are very keen to get started. What's your top tips for people who want to get going in the world of journalism? So I always say to the students, um, you need to read. I know this sounds really obvious. Read really, really widely across all mediums um, to connect with people. There are so many opportunities out there. So if you have something that you're really interested in, follow that like that 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 will actually get you work hopefully um paid work um i was very fortunate because i did that really followed the interests you know that that um the things that i was really interested in i'm not saying it's easy it's not it's really difficult but um it's really worth pursuing and um so making those connections and you know often older journalists um are very happy to help um, the kindness of strangers. There was very many people who helped me when I was younger, so I always try and do the same now to younger journalists or even older people who might want to get into journalism or to writing. Thank you, Roisin. Catherine, in the world of politics or festivals or publishing, you, you've spanned so many. What are your tips for, for people starting up? Uh, yeah, my, my, my potted career is quite a good example of, um, for, you know, following things that really like as Rasheen just said the thing that you're passionate about if you put put your efforts into that thing whether it's blogging or you know put, knocking on people's doors in a virtual sense right now I, I, I just there are I, I know that volunteering is a problematic thing because not all of us have the luxury of being able to afford to do that but if you can spare even an hour to give to an organization and kind of get your foot in the door that is massively helpful um, and then you create your own networks and they they often lead to interesting and unusual places. Thank you, uh, all great tips. 
Uh, Marta in the question feed asks us, what do you do about sometimes the, the, the bar is set high in particular, she's bothered about the fact that there are uh, entry fees, the prizes. Are there people who are kept out? And what can you do to get over those kinds of obstacles? I'm gonna go back to Catherine there because you're most in involved in prizes, Catherine. What do you think? So with our prize, we have a, a nominal entry fee of eight pounds, um, which simply covers the administration of the prize. And in, e even though we have that, we are we invite people to write to us and let us know if they can't afford that. And we give free entries. And we've also been really, really honoured that uh, private donors have, have sponsored places for people to enter the prize. So people have donated money to cover those fees um, for us. Um, and the same goes to the festival, actually. If you, uh, we, tr we, we price the festival um, as low as we possibly can to make it viable, but we also offer free free spaces to those who are on benefits or, um, in, a, or in another way, don't think they'll be able to afford to come. So um, I've completely forgotten what the oh it's about prize <laughs> prize fees. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I think that there is a you know now that I'm behind one, I know that you do have to you do have to put some money into it. But I, I making making free places available is one way of quickly democratizing the whole process. Thanks. Then I think we've just got time to answer one more question, which is about size. Now, this is really relevant to us. We're looking here, uh, Roisin, you mentioned ITN, right from the enormous down to Sophia's nimble, uh, you know, autonomous DIY ethic of, of really quite small projects, but projects that perhaps are, are, are easier to make workable in one's life. Um, what do panelists think about the question of size? Should we aim big because big allows us to, to do big things. Was Virago right to be a global success story, a, a global company? Uh, or is there something to be really said for the very small projects? Sophia, thoughts on size? Um, yeah, kind of coming back to one of those other questions about getting paid. Firstly, we, we did everything with unpaid for about four years and that was fine because it was fulfilling a lot of things in us that were not monetary. Um, but then kind of when we started working with institutions, we insisted on being paid for everything because we recognized that everybody else was getting paid. <laughs> uh, in terms of size, I think it's taken us a while to figure out, to kind of marry ambition with capacity and really identify what everybody's capacity is and then match that up very um, evenly. And that's just helped to guide us. So we just do what's, what's in our capacity without overstretching anybody. Thank you. Uh, 20 seconds left. Roisin, any thoughts on size? Yeah, so um, obviously size has changed a lot now with social media, you know, all this Twitter when people have 24,000 followers or whatever. Um, I think really, you know, so it's, that means what reach do you have? I suppose they're talking about what reach do you have? And I, I wouldn't obsess too much about it. I think in Spare Rib, if you look at Spare Rib, it starts so small, we didn't actually have very huge circulation, but the impact it made was huge. So really, if you have something really important to say, um, you, you reach your audience and you probably increase your size of audience or readers. Great, Catherine, Women's Equality Party, it's very small, uh, does it matter? Uh, well, the perfect example in politics is UKIP. It was very small and look at the <laughs> seismic impact it's had on, on where we are now, so. Thank you. We have to leave it there. It's been a fantastic hour. I'm so grateful. Sophia, Roisin, Catherine, it's been wonderful. I'm handing over now to Professor Margareta Jolly for just a few words of farewell, but thank you to everyone who's been out there listening to us. Um, also, this is about lots of thank yous. Um, and just to throw in, um, I'm sure, you know, if UKIP can do it, the feminists and anti-racists and progressive people can do much, much better in a, in a much gentler way. So, um, before we close, let me thank our truly inspiring speakers and of course you all at home for joining this critical debate and all of the wrestling tangles that we, we know are, are around us. I want to thank our fabulous chair, Lucy Delap and project partner, Polly Russell. And if you missed anything, all will be recorded and available on the British Library's website. And you'll also find a place to send any feedbacks to us, which of course be much appreciated. This festival has been brought to you by the Business of Women's Words, a research project partnered with the British Library that's exploring and taking inspiration from the feminist publishing revolution of the 70s and 80s. And I want to say that today's speakers showed to me that the struggle continues, but also solutions continue. You are all finding solutions and sharing them with us. So 
Thank you all for your inspiration, creativity and solidarity. We hope you keep in touch.